ready? Yes. Welcome to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy, a production of FlagAndBanner.com. Through storytelling and conversational interviews, this weekly radio show and podcast offers listeners an insider's view into starting and running a business, the ups and downs of risk-taking, and the commonalities of successful people. Connect with Carrie through her candid, often funny, and always informative weekly blog. There, you'll read, learn, and may comment about her life as a 21st century wife, mother, daughter, and entrepreneur. And now it's time to get all up in your business with Carrie McCoy. Thank you, Gray. If right now you're sitting at your computer, you might want to watch the show on flagandbanner.com's Facebook page. I'm waving at everybody there. It's kind of fun to see what goes on behind the scenes. This show, Up in Your Business with Carrie McCoy, began as a calling for me. After four decades of running a small business, I felt I had something to share. I wanted to create a platform for not just me, but other business owners and successful people to pay forward their experiential knowledge in a conversational way. Originally, my team and I thought it would be this easy, informative, one hour a week interview, and boy, were we wrong. As with every new endeavor, it's harder than first thought. Once again, I find myself at the onset of starting and running yet another new business, this podcast, and doing exactly what this show is all about, creating business, taking risks, working hard, and yes, sharing knowledge. After interviewing over 100 successful people, I've noticed a common thread among my guests. It's no secret they work hard, but I've also learned they usually harbor a belief in a higher power, have a heart of a teacher, and are creative because business in of itself is creative. My guest today checks all the aforementioned boxes. Arkansas's first lady, Mrs. Susan Hutchinson, is a school teacher by trade, a piano player by hobby, and an advocate for those without a voice, the children of Arkansas. Arkansas's first lady, Miss Susan Hutchinson, was born in Atlanta, Georgia, the second of seven children. At a young age, she was smart and ambitious, having graduated valedictorian of her high school and having lofty goals of one day becoming a doctor. After attending college, Bob Jones University in South Carolina, Susan met a man from Arkansas, an ambitious man named Asa Hutchinson. After graduating college and before moving to Arkansas and marrying Asa, she taught science and math at a high school in Memphis, Tennessee. Mrs. Hutchinson has been a lifelong voice and advocate for children. Today, she is working hard to establish more children's advocacy centers throughout Arkansas. In addition, the First Lady plays piano and sees the arts as a brain builders for our children. She believes all students should have at least one year of exposure to the arts. It is a pleasure and a privilege to welcome to the table the talented and passionate First Lady of Arkansas, Mrs. Susan Hutchinson. Oh, thank you, Karen. I appreciate that. You're so welcome. You say it so well. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, you. Thank you so much for coming on. You and I met uh, this year, earlier this year, and yeah. I said, you've got to come on the radio with me. You're just charismatic, and I love being around <laughs> you. you. You've got a great uh, high energy. Uh, but you like to say, and I quote, I read this, you said this, I am about as blue collar as it gets. Yes. What does that mean? I uh, didn't tell my parents that Asa was involved in politics for quite a few years. Why does that make you blue collar? Um, my experience, <clears throat> excuse me, my experience with blue collar, whole family, mm-hmm. both sides, blue collar, was um, an immediate assumption that politicians are uppity, think they're smarter, better than they are because they're not in politics. They're not out campaigning for somebody they never have they've never met a politician I'd never met a politician till we moved to northwest Arkansas and John Paul Hammerschmidt was in town and they said Susan you drive him to the airport strip and wow you know I met him um <clears throat> but hard working six days a week working um and dad <clears throat> sold um tires Really? Off the back of the truck. And uh, the more tires he sold, the more he made. He, mm-hmm. he, they were by consignment. So uh, long hours, 
He'd leave before we did for school and, and tires come are home heavy. after work. And tires are heavy. Tires it's are heavy work. and they're dusty and it all gets into your skin. It gets into your scalp. It's under your fingernails. I bet he had great arms, though, from lifting tires all Yeah, he was, he was strong um, and used that lava soap, steam, shower, on and on and on. It's just hard work. So your family had a little bit of a distrust towards politicians because they didn't know one. Well, they didn't know them, and what they knew about them was what they read about. Um, newspapers, mm-hmm. and you only had the three TV stations. Mm-hmm. And your father sold tires for a living. What did your mother yeah. do? Mom was a full-time um, homemaker, but um, she started work when she was 14. Mm-hmm. So she was hardworking. Uh, she was so, hardworking. So had these great ethics. Great ethics, hardworking. She had to do that to help support her widowed mother. Um, her two older brothers had uh, quit school when their father was run down by a drunk driver. Mm. Uh, and she was only nine. She was the youngest of the four at home. And uh, so the brothers immediately quit school and they sold newspapers. <laughs> that there was newsboys and whatever other little odds in things they could do to get a little money. And... Um, so, so they probably didn't get a the high early school 30s. degree. They probably didn't get a high school degree. They did not. My mom didn't get past eighth grade. Mm-hmm. She went to work. Uh, her older sister had already been starting work at uh, fourteen, and you're talking twenty dollars a week. And your so your mother had seven children. Are mm-hmm. they all as ambitious as you? In different ways. Um, there's a little bit of a business gene, I would say, that's in the family. So they've pretty much work for themselves or work with dad. He started a little company. He moved us out of Atlanta the summer I graduated from From high high school school. and finished raising uh, my younger brothers and sisters out there. It's halfway between Atlanta and uh, Athens. Mm -hmm. So you wanted to, I don't know how, if you were living in the country with your parents, you decided I'm going to grow up one day and be a doctor because I read where you had ambitions to be a doctor. You graduated valedictorian of your class. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, I made straight A's. <laughs> so you, if people said, well, you know, what's your best subject? It's like, well, I don't really have a hard subject. I, I, just, I just enjoyed everything. I enjoyed learning, and I memorized a lot, and I was playing piano. Mom insisted on lessons that... Um, when I was in third grade, eight years old, um, sacrificed to do that. Um, we didn't go out to eat. Um, if if we did happen to go out to eat, it would be a like a drive-in with car hops, the varsity in yeah. downtown Atlanta. But that stopped after the third kid. I mean, we didn't do that anymore. So your mother must have really believed in music because you are ta- you're describing a family that doesn't have a lot of money, and yet they put money up for a piano lessons for you. Yeah, mom insisted on that, and uh, you know, why, why a dollar is that? Half. I asked her that because it was a sacrifice, and I knew it. And um, buying an old piano, you know, yeah, uh, that was hard. The first one, the pedals didn't work, and half and some of the keys stuck. It, it was hard. Uh, to learn to play on it. But did all your sisters did. play? Um, the four of us took piano lessons, but when we, we moved outside of Atlanta, Mom had a hard time finding somebody else. So I don't know that the younger ones actually played an instrument. I would have felt like that was a lot of responsibility for my parents to make those kind of sacrifices, to make me so that I could play, take lessons, yeah. and then I would be like, I would feel so obligated to practice and try to do good. Right, and then you got the music sheets, Mm-hmm. sheet music mm-hmm. and the books and all that so we we handed them down <laughs> as mm-hmm. much as possible in that but I, I did after I was growing and married I asked her how come and um, she said that um, growing up she had this dream that one day she would be able to play the piano and that she would be sitting at a huge black grand piano and playing like Liberace mm. with the candelabras and everything. And it's just her private little dream. And so she wanted us to have a possibility of um, learning the piano. So through the years, I uh, played at church and helped out 
Are you good? Yeah, different little. You still play? Yeah. I still play, but I'm not well practiced. Mm, you've got so to practice. You, you have to practice and keep it all nimble and you moving sure along. Do. You, but I, I, now I play for myself, but we were in small churches um, pretty much all through the early years of the marriage, and I was the volunteer pianist, and and I have great memories. Asa would um, <coughs> work with the youth, and he was doing that even his first year of uh, law school, going back and working with the youth all the way from Fayetteville to Gravit, which is a solid hour's drive mm-hmm. in, in that day. Uh, and so he was rather excited. I knew how to play the piano, so I would play the piano while he led in little choruses. And uh, he plays trumpet and cornet. He does? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So y'all are a little band? Do your children play? <laughs> well, I had all of them learn. Three of them learned piano, and the, and, uh, the boys all learned a, a horn. Uh, two of them learned trombone, and the one learned trumpet. So do you and y'all get together? Do y'all play music? It, it, that would take something <laughs> for them to get together. I'm not sure they all kept the trombone. But um, it was important, and I've learned since then, that um, learning music early, early on or, or at any point in your life is something about, well, there's the listening to music, to good music that does great things for your brain and actually increases your intelligence and actually stimulates your neurons to grow and and connect left brain right brain like 66 percent of your surgeons are musicians what yeah they're musicians because it especially for men they're um thinking mono they they compartmentalize and they do that naturally Mm -hmm. because the left brain and the right brain is not as well connected as it is in the female brain, it's totally connected. Mm. So that's the reason we can multitask. So we listen in stereo. So that's how you can be holding a crying baby and frying the potatoes, <laughs> talking on the phone and telling the kids, don't slam the door. <laughs> yeah, we can do all that. <laughs> Guys, it's like, just don't bother me. I'm, I'm trying to do this. How many times have we heard that? So it's all natural. So uh, it does stimulate the brain. And if you're participating in the music and making the music or clapping with the music or walking with the music or banging on something with the music, that you're part of it, it does even more. And it helps people with dementia. Um, it, really? Mm-hmm. But besides, even still at my age, if I listen to music, which I do all the time. Oh, they perform much. You perform much better. Whatever level you I are agree. with the d- digression of the disease. It helps you to do better than you have been doing. Yeah. And uh, okay. And th- there's other simple little things you can do, too. But the music is just, besides being therapeutic and making mm-hmm. you feel better mm-hmm. or helping you to express yourself, melancholies, please, you all need to learn an instrument um, to express yourself and your, your different moods. I'm more melancholy than not. And you don't it, seem it, like it. it <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Um, you really have to... Um, express yourself and you don't always want to put it in words so i would just play different kinds of music to express my romantic side or or just energy side or mm-hmm. upsettedness are your or parents still alive? side sadly no mm-hmm. i think this is a great place to take a break when we come back we'll continue our conversation with arkansas's first lady susan hutchinson we'll talk about her passion continue talking about her passions helping children another passion Yes. Helping children and the challenges facing her in doing so, and the life and role of a first lady. And we'll talk more about the arts and education and youth. We'll be back after the break. Thank you. You're listening to Up In Your Business with me, Carrie McCoy, and I'm speaking today with Arkansas's first lady, Mrs. Susan Hutchinson, wife, of course, to Governor Asa Hutchinson. Before the break, we talked about Susan growing up, blue-collar worker, as blue-collar, she says, as it gets, about her family struggles, about how her mother believed in piano lessons and how she wanted to have her dream uh, played out in her children, and she so she provided all these opportunities for Susan, which is really sweet. Um and I did then, get close to that dream for her. You did? What'd you do? I got to the mansion and I was approached to collaborate with um, maestro Philip Mann to do a little concert on the grounds with the symphony and for me to play the piano with them. How scary was that? That was scary. <laughs> <laughs> that was scary. 
Siri. I kept trying. No, it's more of a hobby. You know, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not a Tatiana. Did you do um, it or no? I did. You did. I did it, and um, I did it for mom. Oh, I love that. Story. That's the only reason I did it. I did it for mom. Just, I knew. say a little prayer to her and give her a little yeah. point up to her. Yeah. That's yeah. Sweet. Exactly. That man is from the Arkansas Symphony. Right. Mm. Um, he's. Uh, uh, no longer there, mm-hmm. and uh, we've lost him to Texas. I hate that. And uh, I do too. And uh, Texarkana, I mean, it was just amazing because we um, got back to Little Rock um, about a year or so uh, when David Itkin was still here. And um, I heard that music, and then they went into the search, and then Philip came. So we were there before. Yeah. Philip Mann, and it was just everything you would dream of. The expansion. Philip was awesome. Um, the and Robinson that, Center, mm-hmm. the um, Bond issue passed, and we got all that. And, and of course, the, com- the performing arts are even better than ever there, not just the symphony. It mm-hmm. sounds great. Mm-hmm. Seating's great. The venue's great. So many more things can happen there now and much more easily. Um, it's just fantastic. The youth orchestra mm-hmm. is expanding elsewhere in the state. All the little river rhapsodies and the little smaller groupings across the city to trying to get live music. There's nothing like that live music. And you just feel it and you're with it. And, it, um, mm-hmm. and of course, you know, being blue collar, <laughs> they had a program, though, in the public schools uh, that they would bus us. Oh, into really? downtown Atlanta, where the circus performed, <laughs> and uh, have the orchestra there for us. And um, I just fell in love with it, mm-hmm. with the symphony and Peter and the Wolf and all these different We had Christina Littlejohn on about six mm-hmm. months ago, and she could not say enough great things about Maestro Man. I, I don't know how we'll ever get somebody Those like him. Those two are a powerful team. Yeah, it was, it was powerful. Mm-hmm. It was a very powerful team. So you met Ace in college. Yes. And love at first sight? I was taken with him. Mm-hmm. He had a great smile, and he was not deterred with the usual romantic um, busting answers what that I gave. What do you I mean gave. by that? Guys don't like to date smart girls. Oh, that's true. They're very intimidated. And I was like, man up. Come on. <laughs> I mean, sooner or later you're going to find out. So I got tired. Um, nobody in high school asked me out. Really? A couple of guys at church. That, yeah. Did you know he was going to be a politician? Was he already talking oh, about that? Oh, no. What did he want to be? He didn't. Um, I, what was he thinking I'm going to grow up to be? What well, on he? our second date, he told me he had decided that, um, well, he hadn't quite decided he knew he wasn't going to be an accountant. Uh, he'd done well with his accounting degree, his grades and everything. Um, but he had decided he wasn't going to do that. But through debate, he had to do research. And we were both in debate. That's significant. There's a reason I mention mm-hmm. that. <laughs> um, but he had decided not the accounting. So he told me on that second date, he didn't know if God wanted him to be a lawyer or a preacher. <laughs> and I'm thinking, are we talking about the same God? Because <laughs> you go back to that blue collar thing. Uh-huh. Mom told me, of course, I, I was nearly born in the church, you know, four and five, six year old. I don't remember ever not being at church. Mm-hmm. Three days a week, what? Three days a week. Um, she said, Beside, there's two things Christians don't do. Two. Besides all the stuff that you read in the Bible, the preacher talks about. And those are, <laughs> you don't become an attorney and you don't get into politics because you'll come out dirty. Oh, my gosh. Mm-hmm. I, I, did you and, marry Ace as a rebellion? <laughs> <laughs> no, not, not at all. And so he's telling me this, and I'm thinking, we're talking about the same God. Because, um, uh, again, I hadn't met any politicians. It was just what you'd read about. And uh, Ronald Reagan hadn't come along yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I asked him, so what do you do if you're representing somebody that's guilty? You know? Yeah, what do you do? do? I always wanted that, that too. Yeah, I have to. And uh, he said, well, uh, guilty or not, it would be my opinion. But 
um, in order for the system to work, in order for there to be justice, you have to have representation on both sides. Right. Otherwise, the justice can't be served. Um, you can't prove somebody guilty. You can't prove somebody innocent. You have to work the system. Mm -hmm. So they'll, they would need representation. And he would be sure and follow the law mm -hmm. and learn the law. And he reminded me, too. And I said, well, that's a God thing. You know? And uh, he reminded me that um, God is very serious about justice and that he is enthroned in the halls of justice. When you read about God and his seating mm -hmm. in the heaven, mm -hmm. that it's injustice. So that's what it you told your mother? It is in the seat. In the I didn't tell mom that. <laughs> so, so I didn't tell mom that, that at all. Y'all being on the debate team was important. Why was that important? Well, I didn't. Our paths did not cross. I'd never seen him before until he sat across the evening dinner table from me six weeks from graduation. Our last semester, our last year, and I'm never seen him before. I'd heard his name. I knew he was in debate because I happened to be the secretary of the Intramural Debate Association on campus. We didn't debate other college students. We debated amongst ourselves, and each one of the men's groups, each one of the girls' groups mm -hmm. had to field a team for at least three debates. Mm -hmm. And I was the secretary, so I knew the names on paper, and I knew when all the debates would happen and everything. So we weren't having classes anymore um, together. We wouldn't have any kind of common classes. All of his would be on one side of the campus with the business, and mine was all in this other building that was all about the sciences. Very little so crossover just on campus. So sitting, sitting eat with each other at dinner? Uh, no, that's not allowed oh. at campus. You had assigned seats, oh. but there was an open seat at my table, and he had to take it because they had shut down his table where his assignment was. So out of 3,000 students, he happened to sit across the table. And you're six me. weeks away from graduating. Twelve weeks away from, graduation, weeks from graduation. And, and you're thinking, darn. He's peppering me with all these questions. So, you know, like, what's your goal this semester, your last semester? You know, straight A's. Oh, what are you majoring in? A biology, minoring in chemistry. Oh. But he just kept smiling and asking me more questions. He wouldn't put off by it. <clears throat> he wouldn't put off by it at all. And I, I, I was really taken with that. Uh, I didn't smile too big, though. And then I, I, was just, I was just done with trying to find Mr. Perfect. Yeah. It just wasn't happening, even in a fine institution as that. Um, so... He didn't follow up with let me walk you back to the dorm or anything. And I think this is crazy. And so. How'd you get together? Well, um, one of the other people that had to sit at my table knew him. And so I asked him, what's with him? He didn't ask me to tell him, what's, what's going on? And he said, well, he's actually dating somebody else. Okay, well, what's she like? Well, you know. And. Um, it just went on from there. So every night I was asking him more and more about Ace and get his background and, and all. And he said, well, everybody likes him. He's been elected twice as president to his men's group. Um, he works hard. He has a job on campus. To, it's a work loan scholarship, they would call it. Well, what does he do? Well, he's uh, in charge of the cleanup crew. They work late hours, and they're cleaning up the buildings, the restrooms, the floors, classrooms. Wow. Okay, well, he's a hard worker. Very. And he's not, um, you know, that kind of work is not mm -hmm. too... Uh, he's not too egotistical. He's no, humble. He's, not, he's humble. He's not egotistical at all. Um, oh, he plays soccer. He's athletic. Uh, and so he, how did he, he finally called that. you? He finally broke up with his girlfriend and called you, I guess? No, that didn't happen either. This is the longest story I've ever <laughs> been in. <laughs> We can make a movie out of this, Carrie. <laughs> so anyway, he, no contact or anything, and it was very restricted on the campus at the time how you could contact with each other. Remember, this is before cell phones, much less car phones. Yeah. Uh, there weren't any phones in our rooms. It was just public phones, and they wouldn't cross campus. Yeah. Boys, girls, yeah. and wouldn't do that. So I said, this is crazy, and I researched that other girl. I said, 
not for him, not for him. Not She's not interested in the same things I'm finding out that he's interested in, that I'm also interested in. Well, you were, she was doing the research. We didn't even Science. have the internet back then. No, yes. <laughs> yeah. not, I just asked any and everybody mm-hmm. uh, who so knew how, him. So you, you, I looked at the schedule of the debates. Oh, and you and showed when they up were. for the debates. So I showed up for his debates. That's why debates are important. That's why debates are important. <laughs> <laughs> that took us a long time to get there, and I love that story. Mm, but he actually wrote me a goodbye letter that summer. Oh, he did. And then you went to Memphis. That's the reason I went to Memphis. Why? To cut the distance between Atlanta and Fayetteville. Oh. Mm. So y'all. Had so a long then I wrote him a letter that, um, you know, Lord's been working in my life, and I'm in Memphis now, and I'm teaching in this Christian school, and you're welcome to come see. And he did, and y'all started a long. He said he would, but yeah. a month, six weeks later, he still hadn't done it. This is another long story, and somebody intervened and called him up and put me on the phone, and. I'm shaking in my boots that I'm going to scare him off. Oh, yeah. And he said, no, I'll be there next weekend. I'll be Golly, fine. Golly, talk about, I, talk about segmented brains. Asa, you just have to hit him over the head. I'm interested. <laughs> you know? well, he, he, well, he lit up like a Christmas tree when I, that first appearance I made at the debate because, you know, there were only six people that needed to be there. Mm-hmm. The four debaters, the timekeeper, and the uh, faculty judge. Mm-hmm. Nobody else had to be there, so nobody else was there. It, w- it was not a spectator sport. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Debate usually isn't. Well, it was for you. <laughs> it was for me, and uh, I highly recommend it um, for everybody to learn how to debate and oh, participate in a People few little classroom it. debates. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's Well, it it's really helps you. you to see both sides of an issue Makes and you make analytical. your both case. Very, very analytical. Mm-hmm. And the researching and the debate for ASA... That's the reason he was looking at being a lawyer, was through debate. He had researched and had seen the laws and, and so forth, and this is really good. So that's the reason he was torn between the two. So you moved to Arkansas after you got married? When you got married? Yeah, after we got married. The honeymoon was uh, driving in a non-air-conditioned car, standard, all the way from, which I didn't know how to drive, all the way from uh, Atlanta all the way up to Fayetteville. That, that was, was the honeymoon. honeymoon. You're not really, in August. If you can't drive a standard, you're not really blue collar. Well, I, I learned to, to drive the standard on the hills of Fayetteville. There you go. You like? Um, living, did you like living in Fayetteville? It, it was fun, but I had to pray a lot. Why? A lot of red lights are at the top of the hill. Oh, and you're in a standard. And I'm in a standard. <laughs> and and if you roll backwards an inch, I thought it was at least a foot, and I was gonna. Mm-hmm. Somebody, right. I was going to rear in somebody from the front. <laughs> somebody need to teach you how to use the emergency brakes. You can rev the gas and pull the emergency brake. Well, I, I learned how to do that mm-hmm. soft thing with the gas yeah. and the clutch mm-hmm. and everything. I only burned out one clutch that first year. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he, when did he decide, was it in favor that he decided he's going to run for office and be a politician? Uh, no, we'd already moved um, to, to Bentonville by then. He graduated in two and a half years. Mm. from law school so we moved to Bentonville early and he was uh, apprenticing with um, Judge Mm -hmm. Jim Mm -hmm. Hendren whose um, brother had married Ace's sister so we weren't quite relatives and um, bought a simple house and had a baby you know within months of his graduation from without insurance uh, within a few months of his graduation from uh, law school. Law school, and um, the baby wasn't even a year old, and the first one, and he's saying, I'm joining the Republican Party, and then they had changed the Constitution on how our quorum courts were set up and how many uh, justices of peace you had, because before, I mean, you could have a 100-plus justices of the peace, mm-hmm. and that was supposed to be your governing body and all that stuff so he said he's going to run i said why don't you do that he said well it's new and they need people to run it's it's a new system okay so he ran and then um uh was not successful and then two years later he ran for prosecuting attorney it was an open seat what'd you think about him running for office were you upset with him 
No, it was just, he, um, he was always doing it for the right reason. You weren't like, honey, honey, no, no, we've no. got babies. No. My mother said no, no politicians. We just about paid out that baby. <laughs> <laughs> paid off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was like $30 a month mm -hmm. paying the bill so you were okay without with insurance. That. And then when he decides to run for governor, and he's like, we're going to move. Oh, that's, there's a whole bunch of other runs before then. Remember Mike Ross oh, was did. all constantly reminding me that we had run every decade? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like, I didn't need reminding. I'm sorry, Mike. It's okay. I don't so remember. We did what the did 70s. Mike Ross do? Oh, he brought that up, that we had run every decade. So that's the reason you don't want to vote for him for governor in 2014. So, oh. You know, we'd run every decade, so we didn't. For the governor's race? No, 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 for different things. For different things. So in the 70s, it was uh, quorum court and prosecuting attorney locally. Mm -hmm. And then um, 86 was U.S. Senate mm -hmm. on Dale Bumper seat. And then uh, 90 was attorney general. It was open seat. And then he led the state party. Uh, for five years, mm -hmm. um, and Huckabee was elected during that time, the, the big change-up. And then he ran for, in 96, he ran for Congress and won that and won re-election three times. And uh, then Bush asked him in the middle of the third term, or halfway, partway through the mid, the third term, is to leave that seat, resign that seat, and move over and head up DEA. And then he was on that job for a month when 9-11 happened. Oh, I forgot and then about that. a year and a half later, they had decided and had passed legislation to start up Homeland Security. So President George W. asked Asa to um, pass a baton on the DEA administrator and move over to Homeland Security and be third in line to lead it. Uh, that's the reason they call him the first undersecretary. Mm. So you had the secretary, you had the deputy, and then you had Asa, mm -hmm. was third in charge. And uh, so putting that all together, and he absorbed 22 agencies in whole or in part. Did you ever see him? It was difficult. How old were the kids? Um, the kids were all grown. Two were married. Uh, one was out on his own. He just graduated from college. And the youngest one had just graduated from high school and was up at Georgetown. So, Were you living in Washington, D.C.? I never lived in Washington, D.C. I'd go up there and visit him. Our daughter followed him up uh, and lived with him mm -hmm. when, uh, she got, when he got elected to Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, just a few months later, she finished up her paralegal degree at, at uh, West Ark, now mm -hmm. UFAS. And so she went up there to work, and she lived with him. So she socialized with him and made sure he got mm -hmm. out and everything. And then made I would sure come he got up. Out. Dad, yeah. you got to get out and do something. But, well, well, she wanted to go to these things, and he wasn't going to them. And so mm -hmm. she would she would look and see at these invitations. And so she would say, "I'm going. We're going, Dad." Let me tell everybody that you're listening to Up in Your Business with me, Carrie McCoy, and I'm speaking today with Arkansas's first lady, Miss Susan, Mrs. Susan Hutchinson, wife, of course, of Asa Governor Asa Hutchinson. So I'm not going to go to a break because we don't have that many minutes left. Um, um, did you miss not teaching school? I did. And why I did you not it. become a doctor? What happened? You just well, decided it was too hard, too many school, too many, too much. No, I. When I met Asa, I had already been accepted at Clemson University for a microbiology master's degree mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. at Clemson, <laughs> and um, and I kept pushing on that door and trying to get the funding and uh, trying to get lodging and trying to get communication going, and I was calling them and all this, and they said, well, we'll just work that all out when you get here, and yeah. all this stuff, and in the meantime, Asa wrote me that second letter. Uh -huh. That summer, saying he's not coming back to South Carolina for his law degree, because we said, "Well, we'll keep dating," yeah. you know, because he hadn't told me he liked me. Well, you'd only known each other twelve and, weeks. Oh, or not well, even six. six. We only really dated actually, for six, six weeks. Yeah, but, so it's still early. I mean, he on. asked me out April eleventh, and we're graduating, you know, mid May. Mm -hmm. I mean. Mm -hmm. There was no time. So you were probably praying about it and oh, yeah. just got this. Oh, I knew I was in love with him. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I couldn't tell him that I even liked him because he's got to say it first. That's you know. the rule. Well, I, I didn't 
He'd already been burned those by the, one Georgia those girl. Are the, oh, yeah. it, those so, are the rules of our generation. You well, don't call them and you don't well, say it first. Well, if, if that's the way the guy's operating, <laughs> that's the way the girl's got to operate, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. So you kind of have to fine-tune that. So um, it, it just, it wasn't, it, it just, it it wasn't was, working it was out. And then he's, right, it was. And he, then he wrote me the letter. He's not coming back. And I said, oh, no. Because I'm telling myself, I'm marrying you, and I'm making a family with you. Mm -hmm. And so I prayed about it, and God reminded me that I had been offered that teaching job in Memphis, and somehow I'd kept the contact information, and Mm -hmm. I called them, and they still wanted me, and so I went. So let's talk about your advocacy for children, because you, because when I saw you the last time, a couple weeks ago, at the First Lady's Tea, and said, you've got to come on the radio with me, and you said, oh, please, I want to talk about advocacy for children. Yes. Um, there are 16 nonprofit children's advocacy. 17. Oh, you've you've founded another. We, we've got another Batesville, the latest. Um, we've added Russellville and um, El Dorado. What are the biggest challenges? Money and when cooperation tra- with the with the from, uh, from the parents. No, well, we mostly get cooperation with the parents. Uh, to bring the children back for uh, counseling. Um, copper, um, the money, the funding, and then cooperation with everybody else and everybody else on the multidisciplinary team is from the government. The agencies, the investigators, the prosecutors, big. I need their cooperation. Do you not have it? She smiles. She's smiling. Not 100%. Not going to say. Not 100%. So is it DHS that you work with? Uh, Yeah, they're on the team. DHS has their uh, Crimes Against Children. uh, Well, the Crimes Against Children Division is state police. They investigate. And then within DHS, um, you have a, a division that also investigates. They usually don't investigate the same, but depends on how whoever got pulled into it. But they're all part of the multidisciplinary team as well as your prosecutor or anybody else in government who is supposed to be helping this child, this victim. And then it's us, the nonprofit, the 501c3. Which is called the Children's Advocacy Center? Right. They're called Children's Advocacy Centers. In some places in the law, they were referred to as the Child Safety Center. Um, we're a safe place for the kids to tell all. Yeah, that's important. And they won't be hurt. Uh, they won't be intimidated. Uh, they, they, they're not in a jail looking at people in scary uniforms with badges and guns. Um, we're, they're, they're we more are not of- decision makers as to their future or how they're being handled. We're there strictly for the child to find out what all's been going on. And we don't do an interrogation. It's an interview, and we call it a forensic interview because we are looking for details. But we don't have this litany of questions like an interrogation. It's a conversation, and we know how to talk to children. We know age-appropriate things to say to them, what their vocabulary is, what the meaning of everyday common words are to them at their development level. I mean, simple words like hard and soft do not mean the same thing to a four-year-old that it does to a nine-year-old. Really? A four-year-old is going by texture, not firmness. Oh, really? Yes. They're going by texture. I did not know this. One of the yeah. forensic interviewers told me this. I was like, oh, my God. There's so many words out there. Well, agents don't have time to know all this and how all the kids are. And policemen, well, they're not really policemen, but they're trained out of the... Um, state police, they are a division of the state police, but they are not um, police officers. So if I am a neighbor and I know that my next door neighbor is abusing the child because I can see it on the child's face, because you can see children in their faces. Mm-hmm. They're, they're just so open and honest about everything. You can see in their face that they're scared or there's something. What, what would I do to well, you, help you, the child? You can call the local police right away uh, if you're thinking they're in immediate danger. I would suggest that um, eventually you'll, uh, the hotline would be called. Um, what's, the, who, what's the hotline? Well, the simple way to remember it, and this was one of the things the state police agreed to change um, 
was to make it easier for the general public is to remember 1-844-SAVE-A-CHILD. Well, that's, that's the hotline. Um, One eight four four save a child. Right. It, just spell that out. It's a few extra letters. Don't worry about it. It will. It roll. is an extra. It, yeah. It's okay. a couple extra letters. I was about to say that's too many. It's too many, but it, it's fine. It'll roll over to the official numbered mm-hmm. phone it'll number. Redirect. So if you know it'll the number, the if right you know number. that, yeah, it'll still go to the same um, operator pool mm-hmm. and. Um, they, they're all there together in this room, and they have supervisors, and they take the information. While you're on hold, which could be for 30 minutes. Um, which There's that many people calling in? That's that many people calling in and that few operators that we funded. We just got extra funding through a TANF um, a grant for there to be more operators, and I think we're up to four more operators to answer, and it's 24-7. And it's statewide. A statewide, that number it, works statewide. Is it a free phone call? It's a free phone call, and they take the information, what you know. While you're on hold, you'll be told the information that's needed. Oh. Because you've got to have names, you have to have addresses, whatever particulars you might know, so that they know who it is you are really talking about, and they keep a record of that so they can cross-reference it uh, in case you, they get other calls on it depending upon what you tell them or what's going on. So before you they call, will uh, um, send out an investigator or not, or they'll cross-reference it and see whatever else has come in on so it. So before you call 844-SAVE-A-CHILD, you need to get all this your information on a piece of paper there, the address, the child's name, probably the age. Right, particulars, um, you know, who they're living with, it, you mm-hmm. know, just whatever it is that you know so they can identify mm-hmm. who it is that you're talking about because if they're going to send an investigator out to 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 look the situation over. And it'll be DHS that comes out? Um, the hotline most likely would send out the um, um, police division from the oh. state police. Oh, the state Well, that's So scary. when I say state police, it's not going to be uniformed oh, officer with a gun yeah. and a badge. I yeah. mean, they'll have official documentation as to who they are. Um, and they'll go in and see what information they can gather about that. Because the children are scared to death of doing anything, no matter what their parents do to them, if it is a parent. They still love them. And they're well, usually frightened a little bit about getting their parent in trouble, so they won't confess or tell anybody. There's all kinds of reasons that kids don't tell. Some people have been known to go to their grave without telling. Mm -hmm. I know of a case in point where a mom did. She actually committed suicide, and this is after her um, underage daughter had told her that the grandfather, her mother's father, had violated her, and her mother and her dad wouldn't believe her. And it just kept on that way, and finally she recanted. But her grandmother was actually in on it, mm-hmm. and um, her mom was always suffering depression. And eventually, she killed herself. And Stephanie is the girl's name, and she um, got to visiting more and more with her dad's. I just tell everybody her, you're upset. Uh, dad's just, side of the um, family and for some reason confided in her aunt and her aunt said well, we got to do something about this so they had a intervention oh. the grandfather is a preacher oh okay so they have an intervention you can't be doing this you need help you need to go to counseling it's got to stop so that's what happened and this is in the state of georgia and uh, went to the counseling counselors a mandatory reporter reported so you get investigations well stephanie is now 19 and uh, so she's going to go talk to the investigator <clears throat> which is actually a prosecutor deputy she says something about it and her younger sister is 15 she said well he was doing that to me too oh my gosh okay so <clears throat> the younger sister goes <coughs> goes to um, a CAC, a Children's Advocacy Center, talks to a forensic interviewer. It's all videotaped. It's all nice and quiet. And 
nobody's insinuating that she's done anything wrong or she waited too long to talk or anything or questioning why. Mm -hmm. And Stephanie, she's over there with the big burly deputy prosecutor, and he's interrogating her. You know, what all happened? Why didn't you tell? Blah, the 19-year-old. The 19-year-old. And the 15-year-old's got a CAC. She's got a CAC mm -hmm. that's handling her as a victim. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the deputy is like, you could mm -hmm. be lying. Oh, my gosh. Um, so Stephanie comes out of the prosecutor's office feeling dirty and trashed. Mm -hmm. And her younger sister leaves the CAC, and she feels like somebody finally believes me. Mm-hmm. And I don't have to carry this burden anymore. Uh, and, and do they take them out of the home after that? Um, yeah, the, yeah sec, right. That's the standard procedure. Sexual, yeah. They, I don't know they that take sometimes them, taking them and putting mm -hmm. them in another home is not just because you hear about foster well, parents doing the same I, thing. I won't go. I, I'm not well briefed on all the procedures of uh, the police. Or if the child's in imminent danger, they're going to make an immediate mm -hmm. decision. They They may arrest and but Get, the child cannot take the man out of the home the well it, it can be moms oh really yeah oh yeah why do mothers and I, grandmothers <clears throat> close a blind eye to that because that's i think almost everybody i know that's been molested which is one in three women or i think it used to be i don't know if it's still that is it she, you're nodding well at the <clears throat> the numbers had varied from one to four on the on females before they're 18 shall have suffered sexual abuse mm -hmm. of some sort. And then uh, one in six boys by the time they're 18 mm -hmm. shall have suffered likewise. And sexual so is the biggie mm -hmm. on the abuse um, is the sexual. And the sexual is really hard uh, on yeah. uh, state agent people to talk about. Nationally, it's... Um, 72, well, I, I'm sorry, here in Arkansas, 72% is sexual abuse. Uh, physical is 14%. Wow. And then, uh, and the other, as I guess far as mental. In the, well, there, there is emotional mm -hmm. abuse mm -hmm. uh, that comes into why do, play. Why do the parent mothers not not stand up for their children? Is it usually because they're abused? Is it because they're afraid? Men of, don't always stand up for the children. No, I mean, why is the person in the room, why is the other parent in the house allowing this sort of abuse to go on? They may or may not know about it. Is that true? Because they play, it, it's true. Uh, they may or may not know about it, or if they do, they may be in such a situation, economic situation, or they may be victims themselves. Oh, I see. And uh, I had a friend of mine, a 65-year-old man, tell me just the other day that I have known for 40 years about the sexual abuse that went on in his household. Mm -hmm. Not to him, but to his brothers and sisters that he did not mm -hmm. find out till he was a 50-year-old man. Mm -hmm. And how yeah. how, the, how it, it was the fact that their mother didn't stand up for, for them that hurt them almost more than the sexual abuse from their father. Right. Right. Because silence is condoning. Silence is cooperating. It, that was almost a um, bigger deal. It there's all kinds of situations, and um, I, there's another issue about chronic abuse. <clears throat> chronic abuse will actually shut down the brain oh. signal to your adrenal glands uh -huh. to kick it into gear, uh -huh. uh, or you can go into kind of a frozen state. So, so chronic abuse shuts down the alarm system. <clears throat> so you. To the world, you appear that you're complacent and going along with it, but you're really not. Things mm -hmm. are frozen up, mm -hmm. and you're not in a normal state. Will you come back and talk response. some more about that? Hours. Absolutely. Up. I want to talk more about music. I want to talk. You're so much fun. Oh, to and talk there's to. musicology. Using music to teach algebra. Oh my God. Okay. You're I just back. we just got it started in the Little Rock schools, Six and months. it's sparking off. Six months. Oh, I don't have that. Long. Can we do it tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> hey, we could if I wasn't booked okay. all the way through July. Okay. This is for you. It's oh. an Arkansas U.S. flag and Georgia desk set. That's for all, that's from your home well, for you to put sweet. on your desk. Um, I'll send it. I'll take a picture and send it home to my siblings. Oh, there you go. Gray, I love it. Um, thank you so much, Susan, for coming thank on. You. I really enjoyed talking with you. Gray, who's our guest next week? 
Next week's, next week's guest is Steve Landers of Landers Automotive Group. Oh, he'll be the second time for him to come on. He's a mm-hmm. character. He's a kindred mm-hmm. soul of mine. Mm-hmm. But uh, he's got health issues, so he's going to let me know on Monday how he's doing. He's had some knee surgeries and stuff. And uh, if he doesn't come on, we'll play. We'll just air a rerun of his last show the last time. I want to say thank you to everybody, to my listeners. If you have a great entrepreneurial story that you'd like to share, send a brief bio or your contact info to Kiri at Flag and Banner. Uh, to all, thank you for spending time with us. We hope you've heard or learned something that's been inspiring or enlightening and that it, whatever it is, will help you up your business, your independence, or your life. I'm Kerry McCoy, and I'll see you next time on Up In Your Business. Until then, be brave and keep it up. You've been listening to Up In Your Business with Kerry McCoy. For links to resources you heard discussed on today's show, go to flagandbanner.com, select radio, and choose today's guest. All interviews are recorded and posted the following week. Subscribe to podcasts wherever you like to listen. Carrie's goal, to help you live the American dream.